In this video, we're going to talk about the photoelectric effect and the line spectrum. So I showed this slide in a previous video. At the end of the 1800s, physicists basically thought they had everything figured out. And as part of their understanding of the universe, things were sort of divided into two categories. We had matter and energy. And matter consisted of particles. They had mass, their positions in space were well defined. And after much debate, it was sort of settled on that energy was described as waves. And we knew this because electromagnetic radiation uh, could have interference, uh, we saw diffraction patterns, and that was only possible if electromagnetic radiation behaved as waves. And it was really thought that all that was remaining for physics to do was to mop up a few lingering questions. Now it turns out, some of those lingering questions turned out to have answers that revolutionized physics at the beginning of the 1900s. And we're going to talk about a couple of those uh, little problems that turned out to have really significant solutions. So the first phenomena that we want to talk about is called the photoelectric effect. And so what happens with the photoelectric effect is if we shine light on a metal surface, that can cause electrons to be emitted by the metal. And so the way we, we might typically set up that experiment is we would take uh, a metal surface and enclose that in an evacuated chamber so that the, no air molecules would interfere with the electrons that were being ejected. And then inside the evacuated chamber we would have a positive electrode connected to a battery and then we have an incomplete circuit. So uh, if there's nothing to complete this circuit then we can't have a current, no electrons would be flowing. But if we shine light and that light does uh, cause electrons to be ejected, they'll go to the positive electrode and then essentially that closes this circuit and so we'll measure a current uh, if there are electrons being ejected. Now classical physics didn't have a problem with the idea that light shining on a metal surface could cause electrons to be ejected. Uh, it was sort of understood that there was a force, there was an energy holding the electrons to the metal surface, and because light electromagnetic radiation is essentially energy, uh, when the electrons when the electrons absorbed that light, if they absorbed enough energy, they could uh, become excited enough and be ejected from the metal surface. So the idea, the general idea of the photoelectric effect was not a problem for classical physics, but it was in some of the details that they couldn't explain. And so let's talk about those. So there were a couple problems uh, that classical physics couldn't explain about the photoelectric effect. So the first was the existence of what's called a threshold frequency. So it was understood in classical physics that the energy of electromagnetic radiation should only depend on the amplitude or the brightness. So if you had brighter light, it would have more energy. Dim light would have less energy. But what they found when experimenting with the photoelectric effect is that if they shined light less than a specific frequency, no matter how bright the light was, they never got any electrons. And if they were above that thre threshold frequency, then they would have electrons emitted. But that didn't make any sense, because according to classical physics, the energy should only depend on the amplitude or the brightness. So the fact that the whether ele electrons were rejected or not depended on the frequency was uh, not understood at all. The other problem they had was the fact that in the photoelectric effect there was no lag time. And so what I mean by that, as long as your frequency was above the threshold frequency, as soon as you turned the light source on, electrons were rejected immediately. And classical physics couldn't explain that. They thought it should behave like microwave popcorn. Right? If you ever made popcorn in the microwave, you know, when you stick that bag in and turn the microwave on, it doesn't start popping immediately. Right? It takes some time. Right? In, in the case of microwave popcorn, uh, the enough energy has to be absorbed by the water molecules inside those popcorn kernels to create steam and then cause the, the popcorn kernels to burst. And so there's a lag time. And classical physics said the same thing should happen in the photoelectric effect, especially if we used really dim light that therefore didn't have very much energy. If we shine really dim light on the surface, it should take time for the electrons to sort of build up absorbing enough energy for the electrons to be ejected. And that's not what happens. As soon as you turn the light on, no matter how dim it was, as long as you were above the threshold frequency, you immediately got electrons ejected. And a third kind of related problem was when they measured the energy that the ejected electrons had, it depended on the kinetic energy. 
So what, what we're plotting here is the, uh, the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation on the x-axis and then the kinetic energy of the electrons on the y-axis. And so what they found, and so these are two different metals, and so you can see the different metals have different threshold frequencies, but for either one, if the frequency was below the threshold frequency, we never got any electrons. But as soon as we hit the threshold frequency, as we increase the frequency, the kinetic energy of the electrons increases. And interestingly, they increase with the same slope even for different metals. So the metals had different threshold frequencies, but they had the same slope. So the solution uh, we'll talk about on the next slide. And so the person to come up with a solution to the photoelectric effect was actually Albert Einstein. And this is, in fact, what earned him the Nobel Prize in Physics. It was not, in fact, for relativity, uh, for which he is most famous. So the way Einstein explained the photoelectric effect, and thereby revolutionizing physics, was that, contrary to classical physics, Einstein said that light itself is, in fact, particulate. It comes in little bits. And Einstein didn't use this term, but now we use the term photons to describe particles of light or particles of any type of electromagnetic radiation. And so the reason there's no lag time is because rather than the energy being delocalized as a wave, it comes in little packets. And to us, these packets are really tiny, but to electrons, these packets or bundles of energy are quite a bit of energy. And so the reason there's no lag time is because when the metal surface absorbs a single photon, that's all given to an individual electron. And because it comes in a bundle, it's not delocalized, as long as we're above the threshold frequency, that will cause the electron to be emitted. And so each photon is emitted as the result of absorbing a single bundle or packet of energy, a single photon. And the way he explained the threshold frequency is he said that the energy of these little photons depends on the frequency. And the equation he had is the energy of the photon is equal to uh, h, which is a constant, times the frequency. And that constant is called Planck's constant. Let me write that down. Planck's constant. And just like the speed of light, this is a constant that I'll always give you. I'll write the value up here. Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34, and it has units of joules times seconds. And so the reason there's a threshold frequency is because the energy of the photons depends on the frequency. If we have too low an energy, then the individual photons don't have enough energy for the electrons to be ejected. And so it's only when I get above the threshold frequency that I'll have uh, electrons being spit out. And this also explains the third problem, right? That the energy of the kinetic, or the kinetic energy of the electrons was proportional to the frequency. And that's because any, right, once we had above the threshold frequency, all of that excess energy went into the velocity of the electrons. And so they had more kinetic energy. So as long as we're above the threshold frequency, the higher the frequency, the greater the energy of the photon, and so the greater the kinetic energy of the electrons uh, that are being emitted. And so you might ask yourself, if, if light actually comes in these little bundles, like how come we didn't notice it in the you know thousands of years of human civilization before Einstein gave this explanation? Well, if you notice, Planck's constant is incredibly small, 10 to the negative 34. So to us, these bundles of light are so tiny that we don't, you know, we can't perceive them. Um, but for an electron, uh, which has a mass of 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, electrons are so tiny that these bundles of energy, these photons, are actually quite a bit of energy. And so it's, it's just a matter of scale. Okay, but this brings us to an important idea in physics called the wave-particle duality of nature. Right? So the fact that Einstein uh, correctly explained that light comes in these little bundles of energy called photons, and so light is in fact particulate, it did not erase the fact that light also uh, undergoes interference, and it exhibits diffraction patterns. And so light definitely behaves like waves, but light also definitely behaves like particles. And it depends on the experiment that we design 
which of these behaviors of light manifests itself. And so, you know, this is a kind of confusing thing about physics, um, and it can sometimes be hard to wrap our, our minds around, but electromagnetic radiation, light, is in fact both. It has properties of both waves and particles. So it's some kind of weird Frankenstein uh, between uh, particulate behavior and wave behavior. Uh, but uh, the experiments that we have demonstrate clearly that it has properties of both. And so this is what we call the wave-particle duality of nature. And we'll revisit this in uh, one of the later videos uh, and sort of add on to it. Okay. The next problem, uh, or another one of the problems that classical physics had, was explaining emission spectrum, or line spectrum. And so when atoms or molecules absorb energy, that energy is often released back as light energy. Uh, and so this is the principle behind fireworks, neon lights. In the case of fireworks, when we have these explosions, that imparts energy uh, into the atoms that make up the fireworks, and then uh, they emit colored light as they uh, give back off that energy that they absorbed. And neon lights are the same way. We uh, use electricity to excite the atoms in the neon lights, and then as they give that energy back, it's emitted as photons. Now, as it turns out, uh, when we have different atoms, different elements, the light they emit is not the same. And a given atom can't emit any uh, wavelength or frequency of light they only emit very specific frequencies. And a given set of frequencies that a given element or molecule emits is called an emission spectrum. And so this kind of works like a, uh, a fingerprint. Um, in the case of fireworks, uh, you know, different atoms emit different colors. And so if I want purple, I might use potassium. If I want orange, I would use sodium. Uh, we can also use this more quantitatively, and it can be a means to identify different elements. And this is another thing that classical physics couldn't explain. Just a little bit more about emission spectra. I wanted to show you uh, what an emission spectra might look like for different elements. And so the way we might do this experiment is we put a single element inside uh, a tube. And this is sort of like how neon lights work. If we then uh, run a high current through this, that's essentially imparting energy to those atoms, and exc it excites them, and when they give that energy back off, they, they emit light. If we pass that light through a prism, we can see what wavelengths of light specifically are uh, emitted by that atom. And so you can, I have, there are two examples of here, right? White light that includes all wavelengths of visible light, we would get all colors. But when we take the light from a given element, we only see very specific lines. And so these lines serve as a fingerprint for identifying that element. And this is, in fact, how helium was first discovered. Um, scientists were looking at the spectrum of the sun, and they saw lines that didn't match any other known elements at the time. Uh, and so they proposed that there must be some element um, that exists in the sun that either didn't exist on Earth or hadn't been discovered on Earth yet. Uh, and so they called that element heli helium after the gr Greek word helios for sun. And then it was, I think, 12 to 20 years later uh, that helium was actually discovered on Earth in natural gas deposits. Uh, but helium was discovered by its emission spectrum. And so we'll talk about what the explanation is for these emission spectra in the next couple of videos. Uh, the, the, the very next video has an example of using the equation uh, E is equal to H nu along with C is equal to lambda nu for calculating the energies and the frequencies and wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. And then the videos after that get into more of the theory and specifically explaining where these emission spectra come from and how do we understand uh, the behavior of uh, atoms and molecules and electrons.